Okay, then. Great stuff. So, um, thank you ever so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shawalala, for affording us this opportunity to come in and uh, express on, on this uh, important topic, which is uh, reprogramming your mind um, so that at least uh, we can share as we intend to do as Saljak to uh, empower each other in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, enabling each other to be enlightened of some of the things that we, we often miss uh, between ourselves as a collective. Let me, let me take the opportunity first to, to indicate who we are as Saljak. So Saljak, Saljak is a non-profit organization that is uh, formed out of uh, five carnival uh, pillars that we stand for. The first pillar uh, talks to mental liberation, which is what we are doing currently, which is the engagements that are there for enabling one another to enlighten as well as share information from our own space where we've got uh, uh, information to, to share or at least information to to enable each other and to enlighten or to empower each other. So that is mental liberation. The second one talks to our consciousness or our consciousness, which is where we are saying we need to be, um, we need to drive hard in terms of uh, allowing ourselves to respect uh, those that we live with, to respect our women, to respect our grannies, to respect our mothers, to respect the children, as well as to respect the men that we live with as a collective. And so uh, in, a, in a wholesome, that pillar is talking towards uh, Ubuntu and, you know, the, the, the idea around bringing back the culture of respecting each other so that we bring harmony in a family structure, right? The third pillar talks to the utilization of uh, uh, resources, right? And we're saying we we need to have a a, a a a we need to have a a relationship with our resources, and we are talking here financial as well as land. We are saying in terms of financial, we need to have a resources a relation a, a good relationship with our uh, resources in terms of finance in such a way that we're not haste to want to just go and spend money because. Uh, we've toiled the whole month and all of a sudden we've been paid. And so uh, we need to just go and uh, and spend this money. We, we are saying we need to be uh, wary of uh, how we're spending our money. We need to save, we need to, um, you know, prioritize the things that are important in terms of spending. Second to that, it is the, the relationship that we must have with um, the, the, the land where we are saying we need to harvest, um, to make harvest of our, our little lands that we've got. We know that the country currently, it's in a dire, dire space where the majority of the South Africans don't have the, the ability to, to can then uh, utilize land as, as, as profitably as important um, uh, in that we've got only got our little uh, areas of uh, uh, communities where we stay but we are saying even in those little areas of community where we stay, we need to also utilize and take maximize the use of our land that we've got in our yard. We can plant vegetations, we can plant uh, fruits in our area so that that uh, brings uh, resources to you so that you don't go and spend unnecessarily when you've got these things disposed uh, at your space. The fourth one, it is um, the importance of uh, enabling economy with our local businesses. We are saying we need to push and, and drive the idea of supporting our local businesses. Wherein we need to be supporting Abu Babu Shawalala, Abu Babu Sipe, if they've got uh, their businesses. And that business must be supported from ourselves because who else is going to uh, make you as a businessman to be flourished? So we need, we encouraging the, the support of uh, the local businesses, as well as tapping into that business as, uh, as individuals as well. The fourth one or the last one, it is about the, 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 the changing environment in terms of technology. We are saying 
since technology is advancing such that even now we are talking through Zoom platforms, we need to uh, advance ourselves as a subject to, to move with the times. But at the same time, we are also in, in, uh, indicating the importance to take into consideration as we move into this digitization that we take with the, the youth of this country so that they also can, uh, 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 um, they can uh, enjoy the benefit of uh, being part of this, uh, uh, the, being part of this digitization. Uh, and so that is, those are the five pillars that are, are standing as subjects, um, uh, um, what's name, uh, pillars and cardinals that we stand for. Let me, let me then take the opportunity to then introduce Ubabu uh, Shabalala. Ndate Shabalala, he is a, he is an author. He is also a former uh, teacher. He's a man who has uh, qualified as a teacher and he's a former teacher. He's uh, an author, a person who normally writes uh, books. He's also a motivational speaker. He, he goes by the saying that he wants to give back to those, uh, to the people such that they recognize their call into this earth. Meaning he recognizes that uh, each and every one of us has got a unique way in which we can make an incremental change to the betterness of us living together in, the, in this world. So that is the theory or the philosophy that Ndate Shabalala is using, or at least is driving in terms of expressing himself and, 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 and really encouraging those that he work with. Ndate Shabalala as well is a unionist. He is uh, the one that uh, uh, gives uh, training uh, in terms of uh, the unions. And he goes around the country uh, doing those kind of work in terms of wherever uh, his work is expecting him to be placed so that he can bring um, training in terms of uh, the aspects that are related to train union in his, uh, in his space. That being said, ladies and gentlemen, let me then uh, crack into it and give Ndate Shabala the opportunity to then come in and, uh, and, and, and then uh, uh, to, to, to lead us in terms of this uh, project or this uh, topic that we're trying to talk to today, which is reprogramming your mind. Dr. Shabalala, the, the, sp the space is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, firstly, I must say uh, good afternoon. And uh, I want to take this time to thank the leadership of Saljek for having seen it fit that I should come and share this afternoon. I believe um, that we will learn something from, from this session. And uh, I'm looking forward to having an interaction at the, at the end of my presentation, if there are any questions uh, pertaining to what I've shared. Um, um, I, I'm a firm believer in empowering people. That's why I was a, I was a teacher and um, I, I, when I left teaching, I thought I have stopped being a teacher without realizing that teaching, it's not what you do, but it's who you are. Let me reiterate, the teaching is not what you do, but it is who you are. So when I left teacher, teaching, I thought I've stopped being a teacher without realizing that once a teacher, always a teacher. So wherever I go, I'm still teaching because teaching is who I am. It's not, not what I'm doing. Now today, I have prepared a presentation on mental transformation. So I'm going to take you through different slides on mental transformation. Um, so yeah, I just want to welcome all everybody who has just joined us and I hope others will find us on the way. Now I'm going to talk about mental transformation. Now mental transformation is made up of two words, mental and transformation. Now transformation is a process of change. Mental, it relates to the mind. Now, I, I want to just show you a few things. Why did I choose such a thing? Now, if you look, it says the most powerful animal on the land is a lion. The lion is the most powerful animal on land. And the most powerful animal in the sea is a shark, especially the great white shark. That's the most powerful animal in the sea. And the most powerful animal in the sky, or bay, it is an eagle. The eagle is the most powerful animal. Um, bed in the sky and the most powerful being on earth is human beings now i want to say this human beings are the most powerful thing because if you look at throughout all the inventions 
that are all over the world. You see what human beings have achieved, um, what human beings can achieve, what human beings have developed. So human beings are so powerful. So human beings can do so much. And the strength of human beings is the mind. The mind. The mind is the most powerful tool in a human being's life. The mind. Now, I want to say there, there's, there's, there's something, an experiment that was once conducted. So what happened was um, a group of scientists decided to take um, four um, monkeys and they put them in a cage. And on top of the cage, they put, they, they put in bananas. They opened the top of the cage and they were releasing in bananas. So what happened was when the monkeys started seeing the bananas, they tried to climb through the cage to reach out to the bananas. But every time the monkeys tried to reach out to the bananas, the scientists started spraying those monkeys with water. And no matter how much the monkeys tried to, to reach out to the bananas, the, the scientists would always spray, spray them with water. So with time, the four monkeys, they tried as much as they could to get the bananas, but they realized they couldn't, and they ended up giving up. So what happened after was the, the, the scientists, after some time, when they realized that the monkeys are no longer trying to reach out to those bananas, they removed one monkey from the four, and they introduced a new one. And after some time, they closed the, the cage, and they brought again those bananas. Now, the three monkeys that have experienced being sprayed violently with water started stopping this new monkey that was trying to reach out to the bananas. So no matter how much the monkey tried, the three monkeys that have been sprayed with water, they, 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 they disciplined that monkey to say, don't go for the water, for the, for the, for the bananas, because you're going to get sprayed with water. So what happened was, after some time, they removed um, one of the three monkeys that have been sprayed with water, and they replaced that with a new monkey. So there were two monkeys that have never been sprayed with water and two monkeys that have been sprayed with water. Again, the two monkeys that have been sprayed with water stopped. They did all they could to stop the new monkey that has just come in, that was trying to reach out to those bananas. And after some time, they removed one of the two remaining monkeys that have been sprayed with water, and they placing another monkey that was not sprayed with water. Now, the new monkey also tried. Now, now there were three monkeys that were trying to stop this new one from reaching out to those bananas. And at the end of the session, they removed the remaining monkey that was sprayed with water, and they put in a new monkey that is you know, a new monkey into the cage. So there were four monkeys that were never sprayed with water. And the new monkey tried to reach out to the bananas. And the three monkeys that were taught not to go for, for those bananas, they stopped that monkey from reaching out to the, 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 the banana. So that I call it a monkey syndrome, that people program, if, if they have programmed our grandparents, our grandparents end up programming us, I mean our parents, and our parents end up programming us, and we end up programming our children. So it becomes a chain, a chain of programming. Now, this, it's similarly to what's happening in Africa. If you look at Africa, Africa is the richest continent in the world. I mean, you talk about all kinds of minerals, you find them in Africa. But Africa is a continent of contradictions because despite being rich, Africa is still, it's a continent inhabited by poor people, poor children, you know, all over the place. If you talk about the picture of poverty, the picture of Africa, now, for a long time, as a proud African, I've been wondering why is the story of Africa the way it is? And as I was studying, I realized that everything that's happening in Africa, it's not by default, but by design. Everything that you see in Africa is not by default, but it's by design. The dysfunctionality that you see in Africa is not by default, but by design. Um, the, the poverty that is in Africa is not by default, but by design. Um, corruption and immoral leaders that we have, it's not by default, but by design. A dysfunctional education system, um, it's not by default, but by design. So everything that's happening in Africa is by design because the colonial masters, they sat down and say, 
if we allow these people to stand on their own feet, these people will end up impoverishing us. Because if Africans are reawakened from their sleep, the world will no longer be benefiting or stealing from Africa as they have been all these centuries. So that's why they will always try to put in leadership who are, I mean, all the leaders, we vote for them, but they make sure that the leaders that we have are the leaders who are going to align with the agenda. I mean, throughout history, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a historian, I'm passionate about history. I know the stories about Nguame Nkrumah in Ghana, when Ghana found independence, and Nguame Nkrumah was preaching a message of Pan-Africanism. He wanted to transform Africa. And what happened was the colonial masters, they decided to overthrow him, and he was replaced by General Kotoko, who came in and continued with the agenda of the masters. It happened in, in, in uh, DRC when you had, uh, in Congo, when you had Petrus Lumumba. Petrus Lumumba also wanted to transform Congo and the whole of Africa. And what happened to Petrus Lumumba? Petrus Lumumba was killed and he was replaced with Mobutu Sesseko, who was just um, um, a puppet leader that the West wanted. And what happened with Thomas Sankara? Thomas Sankara in Begina Faso, he also came. He tried to bring transformation. Thomas Sankara was killed and he was replaced with Blaise Kampaure, who came in with the same agenda that the masters wanted. So Africa, in a way, has been programmed. We have been programmed to think in a certain way. I mean, of late, you remember there was uh, uh, John Mugufuli in Tanzania. He was doing a great job and somewhere, somehow, they tried to poison him and then Mugufuli was out of the picture. Why, what am I saying? It's everything that happens is by design and not by default. Now, um, there's, a, there's an experiment that was once done by a, an, a, a Russian um, scientist. His name is Ivan Pavlov. So Ivan Pavlov came with an experiment which is called classical condition. What he did was um, Ivan Pavlov, he put a dog you know, there was a dog there, and then he will bring, he will ring a bell first. And after ringing a bell, he will bring the dog food. So every time he brought the dog food, he will ring first the bell, and, the, and then after that, he will bring the food. So with time, Pavlo will just ring the bell, and the dog will start salivating, because the dog knows that food is coming. So without even seeing the food, by merely hearing the bell, the dog will know that food is coming. So that is called classical um, conditioning. Now, why am I talking about classical conditioning? I, I believe that the same way that Africans were programmed, Africans have to go through reprogramming. We have, been repro we have been programmed to think the way we do. We have been programmed to behave the way we do. We have been programmed to be what we are right now. So in order for us to rise up to our true potential, they sh they should we should come up with a process of reprogramming. That's why today I said I'm going to talk about mental transformation, reprogramming. And now reprogramming, it's not an event, but it's a process. To reprogram somebody is not an event, but a process. Now, I grew up way back in the 70s without revealing my age. And um, in the 80s, um, some here can relate if you grew up in during that time. You knew it was during the time of apartheid. And with apartheid, there was a lot of programming. Black people were programmed to believe that they're inferior. So I remember when I grew up, I got to know about a white Jesus. And, you know, I remember the other day I went with, I'm being, I'm not being critical, but I'm saying facts as they are. I went to this church and I won't even mention the name of the church. And I could see pictures of this white Jesus. And I said, oh, these people still, the program is still, you know, still doing wonders here because people are, don't want to go deeper. Because when you start researching, you realize that he, Jesus was not white, but the programming. So I saw, you know, we were programmed to believe that God was white, the devil was black. So everything was white, white supremacy. It was screaming white supremacy. From the time, at that time, the president was uh, P.W. Buerta, the Hrot Krokodil. He was white. The mayors were white. The, 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 the commissioners of the police were white. The soldiers, I mean, majority were white. Everything was white. The athlete, everything was white. So I grew up in that kind of environment. And I remember listening to stories that 
my parents will be sharing, you know. I remember my mom one day came and say, you know, one of uh, her bosses was saying, black people, white people were created by God to lead blacks. And my mom says, what do you mean? He says, that's why white people, they've got long hair and black people have short hair. He says, God has called us as white people to look after black people, to lead this world. And that's why black people must submit to white. And I listened to that. I could not question it. I mean, I was still young. I was, I was still in primary. So I heard what my mom was saying. But then some one day I was amazed when my mom came back from work. It was during December time and they were given postcards. Now these postcards were postcards that had pictures of monkeys. So my mom was very, very angry. She says, these people, they think we are monkeys. They give us these po postcards that have pictures of monkeys. So for me, I started wondering what's happening because here am I am taught that white people are superior. Can't my parents just accept that these people are superior? I mean, I grew up at a time where we we, we, would head up, we, we read comics about Tarzan, who was this white man in the African jungle, a white man that he, he could beat up animals. I mean, we, we read about people like, like the Lone Ranger. He, he was a white man. Superman was a white man. Spider-Man was a white man. So everybody was white. But then something happened in my young life as I was growing up. Something happened. There was a fight, a boxing match, because my dad was somebody who was passionate about boxing. Now, during this time, we did not have a television at home. So we would listen to some of these boxing matches on the radio. So there was a boxing match, and this boxing match took place in Loftus Fersfeld. Now it's called, you know, Loftus, where, you know, it's a, a Blue Bulls team, Red B team plays there, Mami Lodi Sanders plays there. So Loftus hosted the world, a vacant world heavyweight championship. And it was between the White Hope, you know, Herkutie, and a, a boxer from America. His name was Big John Tate. Now, Big John Tate, um, he, he, he also grew up in a place where black people were oppressed, especially in the southern part of America. Black people were in, in entities, they were nothing. So he came to South Africa to fight. Uh, uh, so on the day of the fight, they said over um, a, there were over a thousand policemen, including the president and cabinet ministers, the all white president and cabinet ministers. And there were a few black people because the World Boxing Association insisted that for the fight to take place in South Africa, black people must be allowed to come into the stadium. So a few black people, especially those who had the money, you know, they went to the stadium. So. I was sitting at home and I remember my father was listening to the fight on the radio. I was young to understand what was happening. So the fight went on and on. And at the end of the fight, Big John Tate defeated Herkutie. And for the first time in my young life, it was like a New Year celebration. The whole township erupted with celebration when this Black African American defeated this white party white South Africans. So everybody was celebrating. And I remember we went outside, you know, we were celebrating, um, you know, everybody's ululating, cars were hooting. It was like New Year's Day. Everybody was celebrating. And for me, a seed was planted on that day. Because for the first time in my life, I started to question white supremacy that how can a black man beat up a white man? Because everything that I believe was that whites are superior. So Big John Tate made me to question. And I started to question the world that I grew up in, the world where you just have to submit to white people. I started to question this. And in my journey of questioning things, I started like to inquire, to research, to find out more. And one of the places that I started going to was a library. In a library, I started like reading books. And as I was reading books, I started to look at things different. By reading books, I, I started to find out there were black heroes out there. By reading books, I got to hear about successful black people out there. By reading books, I got to realize that being black is not a case. Being black doesn't mean one is inferior. By reading books, I realized that I do have great potential. I mean, it reminded me of a story of a man who was selling balloons in New York. He was busy selling balloons. So what he will do, he will fill up the balloon with air, with hydrogen, 
and then you know the kids will come they were buying balloons from him no it was not hydrogen but oxygen so the kids came and they were buying balloons from him and then one there were different balloons with different colors and then one young boy came and said say may i ask you something he says you can ask me he says um can all the what kind do you have a black balloons with you he says yes he says if you put air in those black balloons and you release them can they also fly he says yes he says um do, do you want to tell me that a black balloon can fly just like the red the white and yellow ones that I've seen? he says yes now for the first time this child realized that it doesn't matter the color of the skin what matters is the content if like in our case if you've got a spirit it doesn't matter the color of your skin you can do great exploits because white people and black people are not different we just does it the color of skin and i always say a black mercedes benz is still a mercedes benz a black mercedes benz can you know move faster the same as a white the red the green mercedes benz because at the end of the day it's what's in there is the engine of a mercedes benz so my story i started like reading books as i said and by reading books, I ended up uh, going to university. And when I went to university, I, you know, I later in life became a teacher. Well, teaching is not something that was my first love, but I felt like directed in that space of being a teacher. And I remember there was a, a show on TV, it was called Head of the Class. And there was a teacher there that I only saw that at a uh, um, sitcom. And then I got challenged to say, if he can do it solely, I can do it too. So I went to school and I went to university, graduated, and later I became a teacher. Now, when I was a teacher, I, I, you know, I was trying as much as I can to inspire learners. Imagine being a teacher in the township, because um, the most difficult part for teaching is being a teacher in the township, because you've got children coming from a broken homes, broken children, from broken homes, living in broken society, coming to a broken school with broken teachers. And when you bring that all together, that becomes a bomb. So I have seen that like all these kids coming to school. Now, let me explain it. When, when my, my learners came to school, many of them came, as I said, they came from dysfunctional uh, families. Many of my young, my, 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 my learners, they would experiment with drugs. They would, you know, use uh, alcohol. And um, some were involved in crime because I remember there were grade eight sometimes who come to school with guns. So there were a lot of things happening. And uh, I, I decided to take a journey myself to say, what is it that I can do? As I said earlier, I started reading. And when I read, I realized that, you know what, if I transform myself, I can be able to transform my world because real change starts with you. So I started the process of transformation so I started reading books, looking at life differently. And as a result, my class became a place, all, all my classes where I was empowering learners to believe in themselves. I was empowering learners to discover their true potential since I have discovered mine. And now as I was you know, you know, empowering my learners, I remember there was a problem of teenage pregnancy. No matter how much I, I rebuke the girls in my class, many of them continue to fall pregnant. And one day I sat down, I said, but why am I not winning? And I remember I, I read a particular book. It was talking about that uh, America, I mean, Russia, Russia and America used to send their astronauts to the moon. But when they arrived in the moon and they were trying to write the notes, you know, with their pens, many of the pens could not work there because there's no force of gravity in the moon. So they tried, the, the pens were not working. So what happens was the Americans went and did research. They spent a lot of money doing research of trying to develop a pen that they can use to, to take notes with in space. And over a period of time, they developed a pen that was worth $12 million. The pen was worth $12 million, a pen that they could be able to use it in space. Whereas on the other side, the Russians rather than doing experiments, they decided to use a pencil. So the Russians didn't even have to spend $12 million developing a pen. They simply used a pencil. So one thing I realized that the, the, the Russians, they focus on the solution, whereas Americans were analyzing the problem. So I said, okay, I'm going to start 
coming up with a solution rather than analyzing the problem because I kept on saying, why are you sleeping around? Why are you falling pregnant? So I, I decided to come up with a solution. And one of the solutions that I came up with was, I said to the girls in my class, I said, listen, we're going to play a game here. And this game is, I'm betting, I'm, I'm daring you. If a girl in this class, any of the girls in this class fall pregnant, I'm going to buy a cake at the end of the year and we go, I'm going to enjoy this cake with the boys in that particular class to celebrate your foolishness. But if it happens that none of the girls in the class fall pregnant, I'm going to buy a cake for all the girls in the class and they are going to you know, enjoy the cake that I've lost the bed. And you know what the girls said in my class? They said, bring it on. And not for that particular year, in four of my five classes, none of the girls fell pregnant. And at the end of the year, before they wrote their final exams, I had to buy four cakes from my own pocket. Now, somebody may say, but I've wasted money. No, I, I made, I dared the girls because I was trying to bring a solution. And rather than them falling pregnant, they tried to prove me wrong and none of them fell pregnant. And at the end of the day, I managed to buy them four cakes. And for me, I was glad that even though I spent my family money on these girls, on these classes, none of them fell pregnant. And one other thing, I I started, like I look around and I realized that some of the kids, like I've heard on the news that kids are troublesome. They, they like nowadays they beat up teachers and I want to correct it. I want to address it this way, that rules without a relationship leads to rebellion. Rules, without a relationship leads to rebellion. So if we develop the rules, we develop the relationship, it's gonna be easy for the learners to follow the rules because they have a relationship with you. So I started like a process like of developing relationship with learners, like in all the classes that I was in, I started like getting to know these kids, like some of these troubles, some boys, I got to engage them. And when you start engaging them, talking to them, you get to find out there's a story behind. And because of, the learners realize that you care, they start also taking your subject seriously because they don't want to let you down. They have a relationship with you. And I realized I never had a problem with disciplining these learners because I had a relationship with them. So even if I find them misbehaving in the whole school, I would go then and rebuke them. But because of I have a relationship with them, they submitted to my, you know, you know, to my my leadership because they they, they see me as their teacher. And I saw other teachers were battling with that. And I want to say that even as a parent, spend time developing a relationship rather than coming up with rules. Because if you come up with rules without relationship, these kids are going to break them up. So now, as part of my transformation, as I said, I read books. Now, there was something that I always talked about in the classes. I always tell my learners about uh, wanting to write books that will empower people and inspire people. And uh, I remember one day, one boy who was no longer in our school came back to our school and he found me in the schoolyard. And he said, sir, have you written any of the books that you have been mentioning in class? And I was ashamed to admit that I haven't written any of those books. So I started battling on how do I write a book? Because I didn't know, the only author I knew was William Shakespeare or those who are in America. So I remember one particular year, there was a strike, you know, industrial strike where teachers were, or civil servants were in the streets and I joined all the civil servants in the street. And as we were toy toying in the streets, I decided one day that I'm not gonna join my colleagues in the street, but go to you know CNA because I love reading. So I went to CNA and when I got into CNA, I saw a number of books, especially self-help books. And there was a book there called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Now, I've, I, I, I have never met the person who wrote a book. I didn't know what the book is all about. I thought maybe this book is about cooking because it's about chicken soup for the soul. So I, I, I paged through the book and I found that the book had a lot of stories and it was a, all about inspiration and empowering people. So I, I read a few pages of the book and I kind of like liked the book and I decided to buy the book. I took the book home, read more about the book and I found that the book was written by a former teacher in America and his name is Jack Canfield. So I read Chicken Soup for the Soul and by reading this book, I got inspired. In other words, Jack Canfield became an unofficial mentor. I started reading his books and I got inspired to say, I have to write books too. So I remember 
rather than being in the street, I sat at home, took my laptop, and I started, I mean, I started firstly scribbling them on a page. I was writing books on a page, on a page. I wrote the books on the page, and I, I all these things were written in a pencil, like the Russians. And um, so Jack Kenfield inspired me. I wrote the first book. But then later, you know, um, when I, after I got married, my wife decided to help me in typing the book. So she typed the first book. And uh, before you know it, I published my first book. It was called uh, Being Positive in a Negative World, um, Wiggly Nuggets. I remember when the schools reopened in 2009, I mean, after the strike has ended, I had printed, my wife helped me, you know, we raised some money to print the book. So I print the book. And then we went to, I went to school with a number of those books. And for the first time, my learners were so excited to see um, that um, there, there's somebody in the school campus who have written books because the only authors they knew was William Shakespeare and the others, but they've never seen a real author in their midst. So I started selling the books to the learners because I, I thought, I know one thing that I've learned is that young people have dreams while other, older people have struggles. If you try to talk to older people about your dreams, they will tell you how impossible it is because of the struggles or the challenges that you've experienced. But if you share your dreams with young people, they are so excited about that. So I, I shared a book with the lenders and many of them, they bought it. And before you know it, I had some of my colleagues asking me, they said, there's a, this book we are seeing in the school year. Whose book is it? I said, no, it's my book. They said, hey, we are also, we want to support you. So at the end, now the whole school year, now my book was, you know, my, the favorite thing, you know, everybody was, they wanted a copy of it. And it, it went even to the neighboring schools. Everybody wanted to, you know, and for the first time in my life, I had people asking for my autograph. Now, my signature was to sign circulars, my salary advice, and the children's exercise book. But now for the first time, I had everybody saying, we want your signature. So I started like autograph. I was autographing all over the place. And for the first time, I started also getting invitation to come and speak. I remember the first time I was invited in one church in Kalinen to speak to the young people. And after I've spoken, um, the church leadership, they said, may we have your initials? I was wondering, initials for what? I mean, I've spoken for, for an hour and then they gave me a check. And when I went home, I opened, it was a check for a thousand rand. I could not believe it, that my voice could become an invoice. So for the first time, that opened the door for me to say, well, here's a world where I can grow and, 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 and empower and inspire people out there. So as I said, Jack Kenfield inspired me. Now, Jack Kenfield had written over 200, now close to two to 250 book titles under the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. So he has written all these kind of books. So I, I've been inspired by Jack Kenfield. I mean, 250. And all I can say is him being my mentor, I've been inspired to follow in his footsteps. And from that, I also became an author, as I said. And now, right now, I'm sitting at 13 books under the Being Positive in a Negative World series. Jack Kentville, the Chicken Soup for the Soul, Sai Chawalala is Being Positive in a Negative World series. So I've got 13 books right now that I've written under this series. And maybe just to share a few things that I've written in this book. There's a book I call Teaching for teaching for 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 the, for a legal and not a paycheck, the book chronicles my life as a teacher, and I also look for lessons from other teachers who have made an impact in the world. The book is written specifically for teachers to inspire teachers to look at their job at, at their work differently, because the most powerful people in the world are not politicians but teachers. But unfortunately, many of the teacher, teachers don't know that every politician that you see was once molded through the hands of a teacher. Now, the other book that I wrote is called The Mind of a Foreigner. The Mind of a Foreigner came out when there were xenophobic attacks in this country. Um, now, I need to qualify it and say, I don't subscribe to the fact that people should come to the country illegally. So every country has rules. And I believe, and I wanna qualify it by saying, if I come to your house, Mr. Mozamai, and then I mess up or Mr. Malachi in your house, I mess up things in your house. You can't blame me. You have to blame yourself. If I bring my friends to your house, we open the fridge, we drink milk, you don't say anything, 
I bring my other cousins. They start also opening milk, drinking milk from the boxes in the fridge. You are not saying anything. Ultimately, your house will be chaotic. So what's happening in South Africa? I don't blame the foreigners who came here. I blame us because if we had house rules, all the foreigners who came to South Africa would have done, you know, they would have known that we don't play their rules. I mean, there's a country I once visited called Dubai. Dubai is a province of United Arab Emirates. The population in Dubai is 2.8 million. 300, close to 200, 300,000 are the locals, the Emiratis. And then close to 1.2.5 is the foreigners. But all the foreigners who are in Dubai, they behave because they are house rules. You don't play around, they are house rules. Now the book that I wrote, The Mind of a Foreigner, was I studied foreigners. What is it that makes foreigners to be successful in a country where they, 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 they don't even know the language? And I started looking at the head. What is it that makes foreigners to succeed? And I found out that foreigners think differently. So the book chronicles stories about foreigners who became successful in different countries. I mean, there's one uh, Dr. Taban who came to South Africa from South Sudan. And when he arrived here, he went back to school and later he became a medical doctor at the height of COVID. Dr. Taban was one of the most successful doctors who treated the COVID, you know, the COVID. Uh, uh, COVID. The same also, there's another um, uh, um, lawyer who came. He came as a student from all the way from Rwanda, John, I mean, Gihana. When he came here in South Africa, he was a security guard and later he became a lawyer. So all I'm saying is there are stories of people like Chinese came to South Africa. And when they came to South Africa, because they, 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 they were looking for jobs in the mines. They could not find all the skilled jobs in the mine because all those jobs were given to whites. And all the unskilled jobs in the mines were given to blacks. So Chinese could not find any jobs. So what did they do? They developed a, a, some kind of lottery, a game called Fafi. And they started making money out of Fafi. So Fafi became you know, a money-making scheme for the Chinese. It's still even today. You go to different townships, people are still playing Fafi. And the other book that I want to mention is called Finding Meaning in a Place of Hardships. I have been mentoring people in different prisons for the past 14 years. And I decided, like, rather than just talk, talk, I need to put something together for inmates. Because after speaking, you go home. But I wanted to leave something behind that can help them to transform their minds. Because here, let me help you. You cannot overcome crime by employing more policemen, building more prisons, uh, introducing the death penalty, but you can employ the, you can stop crime when you empower inmates who are in prison to go back to their, their communities and to become, to be mentors and role models to the learners, to tell them that crime doesn't pay. I've seen that when I've, I have empowered inmates, they went back to their different communities and they made a difference because inmates are the answer to crime itself. They know what crime is. So they are the ones who can stop wannabes want to be youngsters from following in their destructive path. And the last book that I wrote is called The Next Best Generation. I wrote this specifically for young people. I realized that as adult, adults, we don't speak to, to young people. All we do is shout at them, but we don't empower them. So I decided to write something that will empower future generations, that they can have something that they read. So I wrote a book called The Next Best Generation, and it's based on a motivational talk that I gave at various schools. Now, what happens is whatever that I have learned as part of my, my, my transformation, I went out there to teach others. And for example, I, have, I managed to have five former inmates into writing books. And like here, I've mentioned two of them. There's um, David Fangisambo. He was the, gen, the judge of the 28th gang. He was in prison for more than 22 years. And uh, I remember when I met him, I told him that you're not going to get a job because you've got a criminal record. But you've got a story to tell because when you watch on TV, TV, you know, they show you movies about criminals who succeed. But when in truth, criminals end up either in jail, I mean, in prison or in the grave. So I said, you need to write a book where you're going to tell young people about the dangers of crime. And I helped him to write the book. The book was called Wrong Offering. So he talked about how he ended up in prison and how he became a member of the 28 gangs and how he managed to you know kill people in prison because there's a lot of things happening behind bars so uh, david fangisambo went around sharing his story unfortunately david fangisambo passed away in 2017 
but yeah, he left a book behind. I've helped him to write that book. And then there's also um, um, Basima Chila. Basima Chila also wrote a book. I, he was also a, 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 a general of the, um, the, he was the general of the Air Force, Air Force One, Air Force, I mean the Air Force, sorry, Air Force. Air Force is a gang that is known for escaping prison. So he also wrote a book. And then Basima Chila came out of prison and then he went on to become a counselor um, in, of, of, of COPE um, in, in Rustenburg, Moses Kotani municipality. He was a counselor. And then I also helped uh, uh, um, Joshua Ngomo. Joshua Ngomo was a general of the Big Five. He wrote a book. It's called um, Zoti No More. So there's quite a number of people, but I'm still continuing with the process. And I also happened to also inspire, you know, um, um, there was a pastor, pastors that I'm also challenging them to write books. And one of them was Pastor Raymond Sono, because I was saying a church has a role to play in the community. You know, the church that only meets on Sunday is not enough. We need a church that will be able to come up with programs that will empower communities. So I said, you need to start writing books to empower people. And then we managed, I managed to help him in writing his book, The Seven Giant Steps to Strong Foundation. And then also yeah, the issue of, of, of gender-based violence. There also there was a, a young lady whose parents, his dad, her dad killed her mom, and then later he committed suicide. So I challenged her to write a book about her story, to talk about gender-based violence and how it affects people. And she she wrote um, she wrote her book. So all am I saying is um, I believe each one teach one. If I have learned something, I need to go and teach others. Now. One other thing as part of uh, uh, our mental transformation, I always believe that we have to develop programs that addresses problems. We need to develop programs that addresses problems. We need to come up with community-based program, programs. Like I've seen, I've been listening to Saljek, what you do. So we need more of those programs that we will do in our schools, programs that will go out there in our prisons, programs that will reach out to our young people, programs that will be able to empower communities. Because you look around, you go to different townships, you'll always see a group of boys in a corner. But it's so strange, if you go to a suburb, you will not find a group of white boys in a corner. So that needs to change, you know. The, the young people have a lot of time in their hands, so we need to come up with programs that will be able to stimulate, programs that will be able to empower and inspire our young people to look at the world differently. Because we do have a role to play. So I believe that whatever that I've learned, I go there and teach others. And currently, I'm sit where I'm sitting, I learned how to write books, but it didn't end up with me. I went and taught other people. And currently, I'm sitting with close to 26 people that I have produced as authors because I believe that each one teach one. So we have a role to play to empower communities. So I also want to add that let's change the narrative. You know, the narrative, you see that on, on the news, you see that on movies, everything, even the, the music that we play, it projects black people in a bad light. So we need to come up with different things. If musicians are going to write uh, songs that are empowering people, songs that are positive about communities. I remember one particular year I was invited to speak at um, uh, Alexander FM. And when I got there, they started telling me about alcohol abuse that's in LX, the crime, um, um, unemployment, poverty, and all this. And I said to the radio host, if you want to change your community, you cannot talk about the bad things that are happening in your community. Start looking for positive stories that are happening in your community, and you will see your community will change. Because you don't change, overcome darkness with darkness, you overcome darkness with light. So when you start looking for positive stories to tell, the world will change. You look at how South Africa has been projected. I remember some years back, uh, the former CEO, COO of SABC, Claudio Mutsweni, was saying they should stop high flighting, you know, uh, all these service delivery strikes. And they need to look for positive stuff that they need to show. Well, I partly agree with him that in as much as, yes, we have to show what is really happening there, but we also have to look for positive stuff. I mean, you look at a country like America, they have learned how to brand their country. In America, when you watch your CNN and all these television stations, they don't show you all the evil things that happen in America. They show you Hollywood and all these other things. But when you go there, you find that there's a lot of things. Crime rate in America is abnormal. So all I'm saying is, let's look for positive stories, positive things to do, 
that will empower and inspire our people so our people can look at the world differently. And I believe that, you know what, we need to move from an old way of doing things to a new way, an old way of thinking to a new way of thinking. So we need to come up with change and we have to be agents of change. And we need to develop a chain of change. I believe like the same. When I became an author, I went there and empowered other authors and I managed to produce 25 authors and these others, I always challenge them to go and inspire others. The same way when I became a teacher, I, I went there and inspired others also. And now I have over what, um, numbers, maybe around 15 or so of my former learners who went on to become a teacher. And when I asked them, I said, why did you become a teacher? They said, you inspire us to become teachers because we wanted to be like you. So what am I saying? Whatever that you have learned, go there and teach others. And let's inspire others to transform the world. Let's change the narrative. The narrative of seeing crime movies, everything on television is all about crime. It's all about crime. We need to start telling a story that crime doesn't pay because the payment for crime is either prison or jail. I mean, prison or grave. So we need to come up with looking for positive stories. I mean, like when I grew up, there were so city. You know, there were there were a lot of um, 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 programs on TV that were empowering people. But nowadays, if you look at it, what we have been fed is junk. So that we need to change the narrative. Even with the music that we listen to, sometimes my kids will be listening, looking at me, and I'm listening to my own songs. You know, I grew up in an area in the era of love songs. Listen to all those love songs, you know, Lionel Richie, your Temptation, your Manhattan's, all these great guys there, uh, Anita Baker. Those are the music we listen to. But if you listen to what is being said today, I'm not saying everything is bad about today, but the music, you find that there's a lot of swearing and all that, you know. So we need to change the narrative. Now, I just want to take this time also to thank you for this opportunity that you've afforded me. And yeah, all the information about myself is down the screen. I don't know if there's any questions that you may have from your side. I just want to take this time to thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Babu Shabalala, for a splendid uh, work and the kind of things that you're busy with uh, in contributing towards making a change, making a mindful change and making impactful change in terms of influencing others to reprogram themselves in terms of how they should look at things and how they should apply themselves in wanting to effect change towards the betterness of uh, our collective we thank you, sir, for uh, a well-rounded uh, uh, discussion point or this presentation. Um, if I were to just uh, uh, type on some of the points that you uh, trailed on, you indicated the importance of uh, the mind uh, powerful tools or the mind tools that uh, we need to be uh, wary of. And that example of the fun, four monkeys in terms of how uh, uh, quickly, if uh, uh, you not uh, uh, quickly to uh, look at the influence, how it can influence moving forward or influence a decision that can be taken. You you spoke about you spoke about the the importance to also recognize uh, the ability to want to change your mind in terms of uh, reading up because. Not everything will come to you. You you have to go out there and 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 start digging so that you are enabled. You are able to to then decipher what is right and what is wrong. Because where we are as a people, there is a notion, or at least there is an intent, uh, to displace a certain narrative and a certain way of uh, placement of a uh, 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 mind control. So. For one to be liberated and to be empowered, uh, we need to go into those spaces and read up and get information so that we make decisions out of that. I liked uh, what you indicated in that, uh, um, when you, you, you are making inferences in terms of how Africa as a, a, a resourceful continent, how the, the, the design that has been placed there, the program that has been placed there to, to get our leaders who are perpetuating the disadvantaging of the, the natives of this country or of this continent, that uh, um, it is something that is really uh, to note and it is something that 
we also recognize from the history when you talk about Ntate, Kwame Nkuru, about Lumumba, about uh, Sankara. You even went the extent of talking about Ntate, uh, His Excellency uh, John Maguveloani from Tanzania. May his soul rest in peace in terms of the effects of wanting to push and take a different narrative and in a different way of understanding how the concept of uh, mind controls is uh, uh, in in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, space or in this world. Um, you 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 did that uh, uh, Shabalala indicate to us how you have actually made impactful uh, change to others by by your influence and by reprogramming some of uh, these people, your, your example of the kids, the, 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 the challenge of pre uh, um, uh, school kids' pregnancy. I think that was awesome, sir. And how you also went the extent of uh, going out there and uh, teaching some of uh, your friends and your other colleagues that are close to you and those that you work with to also be in a space to write up books as well as inform and educate others for the betterness of all of us. I think let me, without uh, wasting any time, allow uh, the, the plenary to maybe uh, project and maybe raise questions if there are questions or at this point of uh, clarity that they would have wanted to talk to in relation to the presentation that you've placed, uh, Babu Shabalal. Any, any comment from from uh, the, the, the plenary, the, those who are here in this uh, meeting. I'll take hands. Or you want me to call you by names? <laughs> Mr. Bo. Okay, we've got Susie. Uh, Miss Susie, you can come through. Um, good evening. Hello. Can you hear me, everyone? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, during the process of presentation, um, they, they spoke about um, also helping the inmates. So I, I encountered a situation where I know few inmates. That's my, um, how do I say it? My professional side where I know few mates. So mm -hmm. do subjects take um do they help the inmates also maybe to reprogram or to see life differently? Remember after mm -hmm. prison, I think life in general changes. So do you guys have maybe something that can also accommodate them? And also, Mr. Sorry, forgot me. Sure. Also, do they does it also take those some of the inmates groom and help them? Okay, that's the question that I. All right, thanks, Ms. Uzi, uh, for the question. Uh, if I were to to respond to it, um, so uh, with Saljek, what we do is we 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 galvanize these kind of resources. We're not necessarily at that space yet, but these are the kind of opportunities that are sitting for us to come in and and also extend. Uh, the, the intent to want to make change to those that want to correct themselves uh, lifestyle-wise. And hence, uh, hence <clears throat> our belief, or at least the you would have heard the five pillars that we stick to or we we, st we stand uh, affirmed to, they, they actually uh, would uh, seamlessly see, you would, you will seamlessly see how they talk to rehabilitation or at least encapsulate rehabilitation of those that are doing wrong. So, in, in a in a in a in a brief, uh, we 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 currently don't have that capacity. But um, our philosophy as well is that where we've got people like Ndate Shabalala who are doing those kind of things, where he's already a a, a person that has uh, got an exposure in terms of doing this, we we encourage and we 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 welcome also the extent of uh, uh, him inviting us to come through and 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 have a talk with those that uh, he's. Uh, uh, trying to rehabilitate in terms of these visitations at uh, at the inmates uh, 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 holding. So we not necessarily have a, a specific team that uh, does this at this point in time, but 
it is something that we investors envisage uh, doing in, in, in the future as well in Mesos. Thank you very much. So you don't accommodate women, strictly gentlemen, you know? No, 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 uh, not, not necessarily. There, there, there is a, a we, we accommodate women. Um, what we're doing here is that um, our idea around the leadership gentlemen's club is that we were more focused on wanting to, there are many other aspects that are talking to men, right? That we still need to work, work with to, to, to sort out those matters that, 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 that are pertaining to men issues. But we in no uh, position uh, are, are alleviating or at least uh, divorcing ourselves from saying women must be in this club. We've got a lot of women who are supporting this cause uh, or this club. We've got also a, a what we call the Friends of Saljek. This is These are the ladies who have formulated themselves as a group to say whatever that Saljek is doing, wherever we are in our different corners or in our respective uh, uh, ends, we, sub, we, we, we supply or at least we support the cause that Saljek is doing. So we, we, are, we are all for all uh, resources that may come for the betterment of the community, for the betterment of a family, such that there's harmony. Uh, and, and that harmony can only prevail when we respect each other, when we respect that women can also input towards making change in the community. So they, they, that, 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 that is how uh, the formulation of the gentleman's club or leadership gentleman's club is is is, is pertaining me. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Any uh, point of uh, take uh, from other uh, uh, colleagues who are in the plenary? So, Babu Msheng, you, you, your your books. You said you already have got thirteen books, and uh, um, in terms of those books. I see, uh, and, 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 and it's interesting because all of them are talking towards um, the mental change in terms of behavior as well as a mental approach. And hence the, appro and hence the, 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 the example that you gave around the book uh, that you said uh, it's called, um, the one where you're saying um, you, 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 the next generation, the one that is talking about the next generation to say, that we need to have an understanding as maybe adults as well in terms of how we can reprogram our behavior as well as our approach towards the young ones so that they can understand where we are coming from in terms of making them to, uh, to be advisable, basically. So I just wanted you to expantiate on that uh, uh, level that uh, I'm sharing with you, don't mind. Okay. Uh, firstly, I think uh, just also I want to um, respond either to a question earlier by... Uh, Yes, right, yeah. Yes, just, sir. yeah. Well, I I've been doing um, going to prison um, for the past, as I said, fourteen years, and um, we I, I I was using the vehicle of the church because there are, there are a lot of um, restrictions also there that are there in prison. You know, you cannot just come and say you want to speak to inmates. So I was coming through the vehicle of the church to 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 reach out to be able to 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 speak to to inmates. And um, yeah, through that vehicle, as I said, we managed to help a number of inmates in transforming their lives. And it was not only one prison. I've been to uh, 12 correctional centers. Um, yeah, so for me, if there, where there's a need and uh, I'm able to source out the, the help, hence the reason why is I decided to write a book specifically for inmates is based on the talks that I've had over the past 14 years and the stories, because I'm a storyteller, stories of inmates who turn their lives around. And I've donated a few to some of these prisons, but you know, the need is high. Maybe let me say something. Currently, South Africa, when coming to the population of inmates, we are number one in Africa. According to the uh, prison brief, we are number one in Africa. We are number 12 in the world with prison population. So the need, there's so much need out there to be able to transform life. So my, 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 my bigger vision is to put books in every prison. So if I found people who can partner me in getting the books to put them in all these prisons, they're more than welcome. We print and put books in all these prisons because um, you know rehabilitation, it's something that is personal. You can't rehabilitate a person, but you can give them tools to rehabilitate themselves. 
And one, of, one way of helping the people to rehabilitate themselves is two books. I've met inmates who said, you transform our lives. I said, how? He says, you gave us books. And that book we read it. I, one, I remember telling me, he said, I read it throughout my incarceration. This book transformed my life. And it's not only one, but a lot of them. There's one who was just released on that, uh, uh, Tuesday. He was in prison for 20 years. In that 20 years, I've been mentoring him for the past 14 years. And what I was, I've was, i been doing, I've been giving him books and books to help him find his footing. So that has a role. Now on the book of, find, of, of the next best generation, the book is based on the talks that I've had in different schools. I decided to put that together to make it a book that will be able to empower our young people. Because as I said, when we abandon, we don't empower the little journey in, in, a, in a daycare center or a little journey in that primary school. Little journey will become, will grow to become a troublesome job. So I believe that when we reach out to young people and we empower them, um, as one man, Victor Hugo, once said, he says, when you open a school, you are closing a prison. When we empower young people, we will have less inmates in this country. So that's my heartbeat to say, we need to get books, give, put books into the hands of our young people, and they'll look at the world differently. Thank you. Thank you, Ntete Shabalala. That, that, that was awesome, sir. That was awesome. But let me, let me, let me, let me take it uh, through, or at least uh, go in and just tap with you or check with you, sir. So in, in, in an extent of uh, you having had this kind of engagement with the youth, and, and we are seeing so much of uh, rush and, and, and in lifestyle or rush, fast life uh, lifestyle from our youth, as well as them uh, getting themselves involved into wrong things such as drugs and all those other things. What is your, 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 your assessment in terms of a person who would uh, have gotten at least a glimpse of uh, engaging so many of uh, um, uh, youth, as well as um, your, your, your thinking around how we can regress these kind of uh, behaviors, uh, your, your, your approach in terms of, or at least how you think some of these uh, can be regressed towards a, a better society or a better a growing uh, youth. Remember, I'm asking this question on the basis that a country that does not look after its youth, it's a doomed country because we do not have a future. So um, I'm trying to tap from that kind of angle that Desha Balala, what is your take? All right. Um, if you look at our, our youth, our youth, when you see them, whether it's on social media, drinking, partying, abusing drugs, they're using that to numb their pain. They're using that to numb their emptiness. And, you know, in the Bible says where there's no vision, the people perish. So as young people, we need to inculcate certain um, uh, principles into our young people. We need to come up with programs um, because if there will be less Nyaupe small cars if we come up with programs, intervention, programs, we look at our schools. Because I was a teacher for 17 years, and I can tell you that we've got dysfunctional school full of dysfunctional learners from dysfunctional societies and with, uh, with dysfunctional teachers. So we need to come up with programs. And one thing that I've observed, look at the schools around you. There are libraries, what's there? I mean, our kids don't read because there are no books to read. There are no libraries in our schools. So we need to come up, maybe we start with book programs where we buy you know, book clubs of some sort, where we have a number of books. Let's say Saljek bought a number of books and you start establishing book clubs in those schools we start having programs like this. I mean, I'm looking at something like this, what this this um, a Zoom thing. We should be in a country, dysfunctional South Africa, a country like South Africa. We should be having hundred maybe young people tune into this. I mean, because this is priceless. But where are they? If you look around them, they are dense. What are they gonna gain there? Get drunk because they don't see the value of it. So we need to change the narrative to say we need to have programs where you can have speakers coming to a township and young people, they are bus to come into there and then we speak to them. We talk about the issue of career guidance. Career guidance, yeah. our young people right now, why must they study? You know why our young people become criminals? It's because criminals are, are always there. They are in the township mm. and all the black middle class, they are in the suburbs. And young people, they grow there without role models and that's why they do crime. But when we go there and start, in, you, know, you know, I always say to most black middle class, I said, you can never build a wall that will protect you from the starving people in the township. 
rather than building walls in our in our in our estate we need to build bridges that go back to the township we go there and empower our people in the township so our township should be a place of you know where there are activities happening activities saljek is having this another organization we are running different things in our different communities empowering inspiring our young people career guidance we look at career guidance the old way of leaving it to teachers let's get involved i mean we've got uh, directors and all that we have they say saljek is having a career guidance in cebu game and then we get all the people who are key people in their workplaces they come there, they put in table, they explain to these kids opportunities that are there. I remember one day I was challenging, I was having a workshop training the HR managers from How Trade. And I asked them, I said, what programs are you running? They said, no. I said, what do you do uh, 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 as part of your social responsibility? But now we go and paint school. God, that's charity work. You don't tell me about painting schools. I mean, I need a programs. Programs that can be sustainable, where you say we are offering bazaaries in my workplace. I've challenged them to offer bazaaries to our young people. We, are, we have gone there to tell our young people where are the career opportunities. Our young people don't know career opportunities. They don't know where the bazaaries are. Where, why must they go to school? When the only way, the only people who can show them a way out is the drug dealers and the criminals. Because they say, listen, if you want to rob, here's a gun, join me. So the same way, here's a book. Rather than giving them guns, Let's give them books. So our young people will no longer be taking guns and drugs, but they'll be taking books and read. So I'm saying, let's come up with programs. Where is church's program? Where are the programs? We can't be talking about Jesus coming back when we still have to talk about the land. Let's address issues. He's not coming back. We're still sorting out the issue of the land. Yeah. I think it talks to what you earlier said, uh, when you said, each one teach one, um, and that is the philosophy that uh, we should all drive. And I like uh, some of the points that you already highlighted, a uh, stance that uh, some of us or a collective as, uh, as we want to, uh, can uh, bring those changes and bring those reprogramming of how things are currently done to a better way of doing them uh, by, by engaging, by being physically in there. And, and, and you're true, it's true what you're saying when you say um, we, need, uh, we need to be visible rather than wanting to just do charity work. We need to be visible to do impactful, life-changing uh, effects rather than just, um, you know, you go and you paint the school and that's it. So, yeah, it really, really what you said is, uh, is really uh, um, uh, admirable, uh, my leader. Let me just check, uh, Babungosi, anything from your side, if uh, there is any, sir? Mr. Ngozi. Hey, hey, leadership. Thank you very much for the lecture. Yeah. Mr. Shabalala, we thank you for the opportunity. Apologies, I joined a bit late, but uh, I, I think I'll listen also to the to the recording. But uh, I love the fact that you spoke to the say the church must do the transformational role of empowering people and uh, giving them tools uh, because that's where we find more people coming to church, uh, congregating in one place, uh, especially the black person. Um, I think I think in your books, uh, I just checked uh, if I uh, I am able to get some of those uh, highly inspirational. And thank you very much. Thank you, Babun Kosi. And uh, yeah, that is it. Uh, uh, let's see, Pendulo uh, Kambule, uh, do you have anything to say? I know you just joined in. Um, is there anything of interest that you would have wanted to? To, to, to hear, I, I know that you really came in very late, but uh, is there anything in particular that you wanted to, to of interest that you wanted to hear? Pendulo? Okay, Pendulo is not... Uh, uh, Mr. Bow. So I'm not sure if your network is okay, but uh, anything from your side? Yeah, good afternoon, leadership, and good afternoon to the host as well, Mr. Sai Shabala, uh, and all the invitees that are in here. My apologies that I joined very late. Uh, I've been struggling with the network, battling, and 
also the my app needed to be updated so those are the things that delayed me so off. I've missed pretty much of the presentation, uh, but in the same breath, I have managed to get the gist of what it was about towards the end. And what really excited me a lot uh, and it's to hear our host uh, mentioning mentorship and stuff. And I think that's <clears throat> that's in a sense even the project brand. that uh, we need to leave the brand up. Yeah, I think Mr. Bowe's uh, network is not so good. Uh, yeah, it was uh, struggling there, but I think we got the gist that uh, he's, uh, he's also was excited by what you indicated, uh, uh, leadership, uh, uh, Shabalala, in regard, in regard to, in respect to and mentorship as well as the program that we need to be driving towards making impactful changes in in our society so that we we have a better um new way of doing things in terms of recalibrating our minds and redoing things the better way uh, meaning then uh, that uh, we need to have a different approach and a thinking in terms of how we can make these things um Mshengu, Maybe let me give you then the last words before we wrap up, sir, so that at least we can we can then uh, close. All right. Um, yeah. I as I said we. Oh, sorry, Mr. Shabalala. Sorry, before you close up. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Oh, um, I want to add up on the programs that you highlighted that um you might um participate in maybe in the near future if you're not yet started. Um, that there are certain schools that um, can just bring the youth from township, because we're more focused on townships and the rurals, that um, you, if they are not, if they don't have metrics, if they don't have uh, tertiary education, they can go to that schools. I know one in Mamelodi, even if they don't have fees, as long as you can make ends meet to go there. And then they teach electrical, life skills, and carpentry. I was an ambassador there. So it's one of the things that if you want um, me to maybe to communicate with them, how to work on that, I'm also available to help. We are, we are glad to hear that, Miss Susie. We will, uh, uh, maybe if you don't mind, uh, you, you can actually, um, just check with uh, Sal Jack as well. We can we can connect or at least uh, collaborate um, to also assist in that kind of space because um, it is a good space to come into. And 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 I think uh, the idea that has been shared here is that these are the kind of things that we must drive as a collective. So we appreciate that. And if you don't mind, maybe you can just drop a, your your contacts on the chat box so that at least we get back to you um, in respect to that. Mshengu? Thank you. All right, yeah. Um, as I said, we we have a lot of work to do. Um, um, we, we, we need to be proactive rather than reactive because many a times when things get out of hand as when we, we react, than rather than being proactive. So we need to be proactive. I always believe that prevention is better than cure. So when we reach out to our young people, we empower our young people at a younger age, we will not have a situation where we will now have to intervene when a young, our young people are, are prisoners and all that. You know, somebody doesn't have to lose life for us to intervene. I mean, you look at the issue of gender-based violence. We wait until a woman is killed. And that's when you see everybody now standing, stepping up and say, no, 
you know, this thing, uh, men are dogs or whatever. We need to start having programs now. How do we intervene? So I'm a firm believer that we need to put systems in place. Uh, we need to put programs in place to empower communities, to empower young people that they may be able to look at life differently. And uh, yeah, so we also collaboration. South Africa is vast, just in prisons alone, because that's my area of passion. There are over 243 correctional centers. So imagine if Sai Chavalal alone trying to reach out. Yeah, it's going to take me a long time. 243 correctional centers. We're sitting at 158,000 inmates. So if everybody plays a role, South Africa can be saved. Everybody plays a role. Um, so we all have a responsibility to play. Look at where you're good at. Find people that you can collaborate in that space. And let's try to make a difference. In as much as I read books about Americans We listen you there, Brasai. Your network is a bit. Brasai. Taught me a lot of things, but I believe that we need also books written by South Africans for yes. South Africans because it, it brings in a narrative, a different narrative, and our people need. Okay, let me let me change my. No, it's okay. Activity. It's okay. You are you're, you're audible. You're audible. Yes. It's okay. Just wrap Can up. Can you hear me? Yes, just wrap up. Is it? Okay. Oh, so Susie, uh, thank you ever so much. And um, I think maybe let's just check if uh, um, uh, Brasai Mshengu will join again. Um, I just uh, felt that um, the network was just uh, distorting them. We could not hear. But we thank you so much. And um, let me take this opportunity once again to thank our host Mshengu for uh, giving us this insight in terms of what uh, the work is doing and how he's uh, on one uh, mission to also make an incremental change towards the better of uh, the community, the better of the country, the better of human human race uh, in, 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 in how we should be recalibrating our minds and how we should be doing things the better way. Um, without any further wasting of time, um, I see Mshengu has not uh, joined back. I wanted him to be here, but... Um, I don't know if there's anything from you, Sis Susie. No, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also for the invite. Oh, I was invited by someone. Okay. So thank you very much. And hopefully the next um, seminar like this or the meeting, can you kindly also share? Because I have few yes. people that I want them to join. Yes. So that um, they're also smart. They're also working on yeah. certain things that we can collaborate yes. on. Yes, yeah. I just saw, I was chilly, you know, unfortunately, she said he's late and all okay. that, she wants the video. So, yes, um, next time, if I get the invite earlier, I can invite people whom we can That's nice. come together and come up with something. Yes. By the way, um, this uh, video will be available on our website. So just go on to saljack.org.za. We've got a gallery of videos that uh, we've uh, since done as lectures that uh, how we empowering each other. And so without any further wasting of time, Mshengu, thank you so much myself for a presentation that is well worth. And we thank you for the good work that you're doing. And we bless, we, we, we pray and that God may bless you and your family in keeping you set to do the utmost that you're doing to make the change and to really uh, bring harmony as well as uh, changing the minds and the behavior of those that are lost. Uh, we thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sis Susie. We will also get back to you in terms of that uh, contact that you'll be leaving. And um, let me wrap up this uh, uh, session here. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.